theyeshiva.net. Today's class is dedicated by our dear friends, Liz and Dr. Michael Michelle, in loving memory of Mrs. Michelle's father, Rav Yisrael Yitzchak Halevi Ben Harav Binyamin, Rabbi Irving Levy, who passed away 20 years ago, 22 years ago, on the 11th day of Tevis. Rabbi Irving Levy was a respected Talmud Chachem, a legendary Baal Chesed, and one of the earliest founders of the Muncie community, including the founder of the famous Ashar School, and a person who helped countless individuals and families to build their lives with the foundations of Torah and Yerushalayim and love. So we commemorate his yard site today and this week. And may his uh, light serve as an everlasting source of blessing and inspiration for his children, all of his loved ones, the entire family, the entire community, and all the people he touched among all of the Jewish people. And thank you so much um, for your partnership and friendship. Class is also dedicated by Rebaruch Yosef Markov. <coughs> May Hashem bless Freydel Basara, Ayala Bas Yosefa, and Aaron Halevi Ben Sara with a complete and speedy recovery and many, many good, long, happy, healthy years filled with joy, nachas, and continued growth in Torah and mitzvahs. Thank you so much, Rebaruch Yosef, for your ongoing friendship and partnership, and may all of these people be blessed with Teich Klal Yisrael. I posted in the chat on Zoom uh, the link to today's uh, source sheets. We're going to be learning a piece of Svas Emes. This is actually what I planned to learn Thursday, but we only got to the first piece. So today we're going to learn the second piece, Be'ezer Hashem. So if you open your source sheets, if you're on Zoom, you can open it in the chat. If you're on the yeshiva.net, the source sheet is over there <coughs> near the video and also below the video. And let's, uh, let's get right into it. What we're going to be addressing today is really a very fundamental idea in life. And it's the great question of how we... Uh, how we integrate. How do you integrate the opposite forces within yourself? You know, a person is rattled with contradictions and paradoxes. How do we create unity and integration? And it's not just about ourselves individually, healing our own souls and psyches, but it's also by uh, domino effect, society, people, communities, families. And as you know, this is not an easy task. This is something that humanity is struggling with for thousands of years. Until today, you know, despite our efforts, you see often communities that are so torn apart by machloikas, by rifts, by conflicts, families that are torn apart. Sometimes you read and you wonder, you know, how can it be that people should... Uh, stoop down to such low levels in terms of feuds and, 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 and fighting and incitement and sometimes even violence and just family alienating people who were so close to you. But the question is not just about other people. The question is inside myself. Do I alienate parts of myself? When I alienate parts of myself, it ends up that I alienate also people. And that's, I think, one of the major themes that we're going to be exploring today. Okay, so please open your source sheets. Svas Emes Vayigash Tov Deish Memhei. It's the second piece. The first piece we learned last Thursday, explaining the story of the rocks with Yaakov Avinu. Very fascinating explanation. What real unity looks like. Today... We're going to discuss another angle. That's the second piece. It's from the Svas Emes, who was the third Rebbe in the Hasidic dynasty of Ger, Rabbi Yehuda Ari Leib Alter, 
grandson of the Chidush Harim Rebbe Chameya, the first Geir Rebbe. He was raised by his grandfather because he was orphaned at a young age. He passed away, Hei Shva Tafrej Samachei, 1905. And his work on Chumash and on holidays is a classic in the Hasidic bookshelf. And this is a piece from Tafresh Memhe, which would mean 1885. So let's see, let's get right into it. Zokita Helikis Fasemes. Be'inyin Machloikis Hashvatim Im Yosef. Let's remember that the portions Vayeshev, Miketz, Vayigash, and Vayichi all deal with one theme, and that is the young fledgling family of Bnei Yisrael, where a rift develops between Yosef and all of his bro- and many and his brothers, a rift that ends tragically in Yosef being thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, and being alienated from the family for more than two decades. This takes us through Parshas Vayesha, Parshas Miketz, Parshas Vayigash. Yosef reveals himself to his brothers. Yaakov relocates to Egypt with the whole family. There is reconciliation of the family. Vayichi, the narrative continues. Yaakov passes away, but after his passing, the brothers are afraid that now, at last, the prime minister of Egypt is going to exact revenge for everything they did now that their father has passed away and he may have free reign. And that's when they send the message to him that they want to become his slaves. And Yosef speaks to them and he weeps. And he says... (laughs) <laughs> you're suspecting me of trying to do you harm, but it's completely not part of my intention. I am not in lieu of God. I'm not, I don't play God, and I know you tried to harm me and do me evil, but Hashem, Elikim Hashem planned it very differently. He orchestrated events that what you have done to try to harm me actually ended up in benefiting not only me, but the whole, all of you and the whole world, because Yosef, of course, saved Egypt and the Fertile Crescent, including Canaan and his own family, from a devastating famine that, continued, that raged after seven years of plenty. So now let's see the fabulous and fantastic remark of, uh, remarks of the Svasemis. Be'inyin, again, it's the second piece, the second piece. Be'inyin machloikis hashvatim im Yosef. In terms of the machloikis, the argument, the conflict of all the tribes, all the brothers with Yosef, neskayim bahem ha-mishna, machloikis she l'shem shamayim, soifu l'eskayim. In their case, the words of the Mishnah in Pirkei in the ethics of the fathers, that a machloikis, a conflict for the sake of heaven, endures, was fulfilled. We learned in the previous class, this was Thursday in the first Fasem, as Vayigash, Tofresh Samach Dalet, which is a later year, but we learned it in the opposite order because of the theme, the theme is being developed. Tofresh Samach Dalet would be 1804, this is 1885, I'm sorry, 1904, so it's quite a big difference, it's almost 20 years, 20 years uh, apart, the piece we learned last year was right the year before the Svasamas passed away. The piece we learned last week, this is already almost 19, 20 years earlier. What is Machlaikas Shil Hashem Shamayim? A Machlaikas, because I'm not looking for victory. I'm looking for truth. As he put it, I'm trying to find a place in this world where the undefined God can be manifested. And that's no simple task, because essentially, what happens is, we have to understand that uh, Hashem is undefined. So now, I'm looking for a place in this world that Shem Shamayim, the name of Hashem, should be manifested in this world. That's the Machleikas L'Shem Shamayim. It's an argument for the sake of heaven, really for the name of heaven. What does it mean for the name of heaven? Searching. How do we find in this world a space in which undefined divinity can be channeled, can be filtered. And different people find different places, different mediums, different venues. That's called machloikas l'shem shamayim. And soifa l'shem it's going to endure. What does that mean? They're going to fight forever? You know, there's the old anecdote 
that a machloikas for the sake of heaven endures forever because nobody ever gives in because there's no room for compromise because I'm not representing myself, I'm representing God. If we're fighting over real estate or we're fighting over a couple of dollars, so then there can be an arbitrator who can persuade us to compromise you, the 50-50 or whatever the compromise is. I go home a little happy and a little upset and you go home a little happy and a little upset. Sure, and we could make peace. But machloikas she l'shem shamayim. A fight for the sake of God, oy, 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 soy skyim. it's going to endure forever because how can I give in? It's not me. It's not the money. It's not the ego. It's not the personality issues. It's not even the fact that you hurt me and you slighted me. It's not even that my ego is wounded or my insecurity is wounded. It's God wants me to fight you. Those are very dangerous fights. So that's an anecdotal interpretation. The truth is it's not so anecdotal because sadly it's often true that once you mix in religion, and you mix in this higher absolute authority, it often becomes a great camouflage <laughs> for not be willing, not ready for any compromise. Because how can I compromise with you when I am embodying justice and goodness and eternity and truth? And, and for me to compromise with you would be not a personal compromise. It would be God himself compromising his truth for your Meshagas. So that that is a very... Uh, <laughs> authentic fact about life that it's so important to be able to make those differentiations between I have a personal pain or a personal grudge or a personal insecurity or a personal demand or something that I feel was taken from me, whatever the situation is, and not mix it in to absolute truths that transcend time and space and eternity. But what we're discussing here is a deeper level. Soifel is Skyim really means that both sides are going to endure. Because since it was a machloikas l'shem shamayim, to be able to access divinity in this world and find my space, ultimately, as we learned in the previous class, all the 12 stones of Yaakov Avinu converge together to create one rock. And the fighting where he's going to put his head seized, because when you realize that you're part of one, so then you can have the head, I can have the head, because when you have the head, I also have the head, and when I have the head, you also have the head, because ultimately we're one. So now we go to one step further. So the chalikas of the Shvatim and Yosef, they had a schus that this Mishnah was fulfilled by them, soifel iskayim. And he explains, ki because it's no question, it's certain, it's no question that this, uh, this conflict wasn't just a personal issue, personal vendetta. I just don't like what you look like. You trigger me in very profound ways personally. And it's just my own insecurity or my own ego or my own jealousy that wants to get rid of you. He says, certainly, the machloikas, the conflict was rooted in the fact that every single one of them had different and unique pathways in the service of Hashem. That's what he says. Drachim miyuchadim. Drachim are pathways, roads, miyuchadim, individual ones, unique ones that everyone had in the way of serving Hashem. Yaakov Avinu, our patriarch Yaakov, our father, represents the essence of Torah, the core of Torah. But we know that the core is manifested and expressed in so many different ways. So we have, we say it every morning from Torah's Kayanim in the beginning, Sifra. Rabbi Yishmael Aymer, Bishloish Esri Midoy Satayra Nidreshes. There are 13 formulas, 13 uh, principles that Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Jewish people through which to learn Torah, through which to explain, to interpret, to decipher, to deduce new laws and applications from Torah. They're called the Shloish Esri Midas. Kalva Chaim, Xerishava, Binyanav. What the Svasembis is saying, they're not just technical principles. They're not just technical principles of how you learn. When, in other words, when you're learning Apostle Chumash, when the Chazal are trying to understand the structure of Torah, these are the 13 principles, which are really method, me- methodology, 
It's a methodology, a formula that Moshe Rabbeinu gave to the Jewish people of how to learn. That's true. But essentially it represents the fact that from one Torah come Yud Gimel Midas. There are 13 different approaches, 13 different paradigms, 13 different applications. And therefore everyone had their unique path with which they took the essence of Yaakov Avinu. And how they understood through which the energy of Yaakov, which is the etzim the essence of Torah, was filtered. It gets filtered through your brain and it gets filtered through my brain in a different way. Each one is trying to access that truth, but they access it through one of the Yud Gimel Midas, one of the 13 formulas, Shatayur Nedrash's Beh. There's a beautiful word from the Noyem Elimelech, the Rebbe of Melech of Lezhensk. He writes, listen to this, he says, Rabbi Shmuel Oimer, Bishloish Esrei Midos HaTorah Nidreshes. You can only expound Torah if you cultivate the 13 Midos of compassion in your life. Only Bishloish Esrei Midos HaTorah Nidreshes. The only ones who can really darshan, who can really expound and explain Torah are those who cultivate the Shloish Esrei Midos, the 13 attributes of compassion. The Torah Dvarah, the Rabbi Moshe Kordavarah has a sefer, Torah Dvarah, where he explains how the Yud Gimel Midas Arachim of Hashem could be mirrored in a person's life. So the bottom line is that Yaakov is the Etzim HaTorah. But from the Etzim come out different children, different pathways. And the metaphor for this is also biologically. Yeah? A child doesn't begin as an independent person. A fetus doesn't begin to emerge independently. A fetus begins within the progenitors within the father's seed and the mother's egg. But over there, there's no distinctiveness yet. When you're growing up as an individual person, within yourself, you have embedded that potentiality for your offspring. But at that point, there's no distinction yet. Then comes intimacy, then there is conception, and still, there's no separate fetus. Still, you have an embryo, which is a synthesis of the father's seed and the mother's egg, even after conception, it takes nine months for this to develop as an independent reality, but also completely absorbed in the womb of the mother. Then there is birth, and now there's a separate entity, but still completely connected and dependent on mommy and tati, until we reach adulthood, if we ever reach adulthood. Anybody here has reached adulthood yet? And you could sever your cords Hopefully not completely, but you take responsibility. You take responsibility for your life. <laughs> some people don't like to do that. We like to blame mommy <laughs> and tati. But at some point, you have to graduate the womb and take responsibility and say, "I'm a, I'm a person. I'm a man. I'm a woman. Whatever it is." So there are different stages. Yaakov Avinu, the way he sees his children, they're all one. They're all in the father. They're all part of the father. They're all part of the father and mother. There's no differentiation. <coughs> it's all Yaakov. But then it fleshes out. It splits up. It's like you have one road, but the road has then 13 different outlets, like in Bereshis, right? You have the water that comes, the river that comes from Eden to irrigate the garden, but Umisham Yiparit from there, there are the four rivers. You have the, the excuse me, the Euphrates and the Tigris. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Pishoin and, and Gichoin and Chidekel and Pras. But it comes from a singular river. The same is true with various situations where you have one singular source, but then it's, it's captured through different mechanisms and therefore filtered and experienced in a different way. Matsinu, now we find, Shatayr Nikras Eish. Tayr is often defined as fire. The Kasuf, the Pasuk says, the Navi says, Koi Dvarai Kaesh. My words are like fire. Matsinu Shinikras Maya. We also find Tayr is called water. The Ksiv, the Navi says, Whoever is thirsty should go drink water. Now you don't need Yeshaya Novi to tell you that if you're thirsty, you drink water. It's common sense. What he's referring to is, if you're thirsty for meaning, for divinity, go drink water because water represents Torah. So is Torah fire or is Torah water? 
fire and water work in paradoxical ways and they don't have an easy shalom bias between them because either the fire evaporates the water or the water extinguishes the flames. Says this Fasem is Yosef HaTzadik HaYibchines Eish. Yosef HaTzadik represented the quality of fire. Kedixiv, the Pasek says, Beis Yosef Lohova. The house of Yosef will be a flam fire. Lohova is a glowing flame. Pasek says, Beis Yosef Lohova. Vuhubchines Hislavus. Yosef represents fire, passion. Ke'inyin, as the Pasek says in Divriya Yomim, Vayigbe Liboy Bedarke Hashem. His heart is uplifted to follow the paths of Hashem. Vayikba Liba means your heart is filled with, with uh, exaltedness. Vayikba Liba, the heart, the person stands tall and erect with a sense of, of profound dignity and passion, which is like fire, which rises, always rises, taller and taller and taller, obviously, if it's fueled. That's Yosef. V'yehudu b'chines mayim. Yehuda represents the antithesis of fire water, Shahu Hachna, representing subservience, submission, Utfila. It's represented in Davening, Lishboich, Lev Kamayim, pouring out your heart like water. As the Pasik says in Eicha, Shifchi Chamayim Libech, Noichach Pnei Hashem, pour your heart out like water in the presence of Hashem. Kedi'isa b'gemara, as the Gemara says, just as water, wherever you deposit it, it's not going to stay there. It's going to always look for the lowest place where it can go to. The water is going to flow and trickle downwards to the lowest place until it can't stop anymore. If there's something lower, the water is going to continue there. So Eish and Mayim represent two opposites. Fire is rising higher and higher and water is going lower and lower. What does this represent? This represents the quality of Yehuda versus the quality of Yosef. The word Yosef comes from the word Lohosif, to grow, to add, to increase, right? Yosef. He was named Yosef because Rachel said, Yosef Hashem li benachar. Hashem should add another child. The word Yosef in, in Hebrew is Hosafa. What's Hosafa? Lohosif, to increase, to grow, to add more. The fire becoming taller and stronger and more potent and more powerful and more hot and more passionate. Yehuda comes from the word Haida'ah. When Yehuda was born, Leah said, now I'm going to be grateful, I'm going to be thankful. The idea of gratefulness, of thanks, of gratitude is an element of submission. The word Yehuda also comes from the word Haida'ah in terms of acquiescing, submitting, like I'm moida to you, I surrender to you. It's a form of submission, right? Moidim chachamam l'reb meir. I'm moida to you. Moidim anachnu lach means... I'm grateful to you, I thank you. Also, I'm my dad. there's an acquiescence, there's a submission. So the very names, Yosef and Yehuda, spell out the differences. We learned Shabbos morning, the Maimon Torah of the Abalatanya Parshas Vayigash, where the whole Maimon is based on this. Yosef is the element of continuous growth, self-actualization and self-expression. And Yehuda represents what's called bittel, submission, surrender. Here he says, Yehuda is ultimately the concept of tefillah. Tefillah is that complete submission and surrender and subservience to my higher power. And that's why Yehuda is compared to water because water will always seek the lowest, lowest space. And that's Yehuda's uniqueness, that ability for absolute humility. In fact, he's the first one to make a public confession. The Medrash says that's why he was called Yehuda as well. Leia said, I'm calling him Yehuda because now I'll be grateful. But it's also connected to confession because gratefulness Gratitude and confession are very similar to each other. They both require vulnerability. For me to really say thank you to you, I don't mean just thank you, you know, for, uh, for posting something or for, for passing the tissue box, which is also good. But I'm talking a real thank you, you know, coming over to somebody and looking them in their eyes and saying, you know, thank you, you've, you've, you've touched me so deeply, you have changed my life, you have, you have helped me so profoundly. It's vulnerable. It basically means I'm not perfect and I needed you and what you have done or what you have said at a certain point was so meaningful to me. There's a vulnerable component to it. Some people don't know how to really say thank you. You know, they'll say, shkayach, 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 like a, you know, you know my comedy routine about your shkayach. I'm not going to do it now. It's too early in the morning. But you get the point. Because a real thank you is not so easy to give, at least for some of us. Probably the women listening don't know what I'm talking about. But some of us know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, thank you. Because a real thank you is vulnerable. It's mamish like a confession. 
even though you're not confessing a mistake, but it's the still vo- real gratitude it takes vulnerability. It takes what he calls a hachna, subservience. And confession to say I'm sorry is vulnerable. And again, I'm talking about a genuine I'm sorry. I could say I'm sorry, I apologize. But really to feel it and say I apologize, to take accountability. The buck stops here. I don't blame other people. This is what Yehuda did, the first person in Chumash publicly. Yehuda, in the story of Tamar, in Parashat Vayeshev, he said, Satka, she's right, me many. She has become impregnated, impregnated from me. I'm the one who did this whole, who concocted this whole kasha. He sent her to be burnt at the stake. Nonetheless, he, the one who said, she has to be burnt, he then publicly said, Satka, me many. And that's why ultimately it's one of the reasons why he was given the gift of leadership and royalty. Because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And if a leader cannot say, I'm sorry, if a leader cannot take accountability, if a leader cannot get up in public and say, I, I'm the one who did it, ultimately you have to be fearful of such a leader because it can easily spiral into tyranny, into control, into exploitation, and into manipulation. So this is the uniqueness of Yehuda, who's a very powerful person. He's called the king of the tribes, but at his core there's an element of absolute bittel, absolute achna, subservient, which was represented in tefillah. Yehuda represents that concept of tefillah to pour out his heart like water. And water goes to the lowest, lowest place, which represents that complete humility and absolute surrender of a person, and complete vulnerability. And you see it by David HaMelech in Tehillim. If you read Tehillim and you have an English translation or a translation, a language that you understand it, unless you understand the original Tehillim, the feature that comes out most in Tehillim is David HaMelech's absolute vulnerability in the presence of God. David was a warrior. David was a very powerful person. David was a king. David Melech Yisrael, greatest king. But his kingship didn't eclipse his poetic ability to express himself with such humility. There are statements that Avraham Melech says about himself that are shocking. And they were genuine, how he felt about himself. You know, Just quoting a few random sukkim here and there, but Avraham Melech constantly in the verses of Tehillim, you see this quality of Yehuda. Lishpech shifchi chamayim libech. Pouring out his heart like water. Yosef represented a different quality. Yosef, he says, is fire. Yosef means I suffer. Yosef represents the pride, holy pride, and exaltedness. Yosef was fire. In Yosef, you saw such passion, such charisma, such energy, such creativity. And such an expression of beauty and charm and grace. He says a lot of his slavos, a lot of creativity. And as the Pasuk says, he was moitzechein, he found favor in people's eyes. As the Navi says, There's following the paths of Hashem through humility, but then there's the opposite. Your heart stands tall, you maximize yourself. It's the quality of leadership and the quality of self-actualization and self-expression and creativity where a person has a healthy, let's call it a healthy ego, a healthy sense of self. Yehuda and Yosef hit. There was a head-on-head collision. Why? Because Yaakov is etzim ha-toyre. Yaakov is the core of Torah. But the way it's manifested, it comes out in different ways, different pathways. Two of these are fire and water. Yosef is fire. Yehuda is water. Fire and water have a hard time <laughs> joining forces. That's why we need a pot when we cook, right? The Gemara says in Brachas that if you see, if you dream about a pot, you should anticipate peace. Haroyek deire bechaloim yitzapel shalom. If you see a pot, I don't know if any of you dream about pots, but if you dream about a pot, it's good. You should anticipate peace. What's the connection? So I think the Ksav Seifer says, because a pot makes peace between fire and water. (laughs) 
Fire and water can't really get along. But you put some water in the pot. You put the pot on the stove. So now the fire reaches the water through the mechitza, through the wall of the pot. And the water enhances the fire. The fire enhances the water because the fire cooks up the water. And the water allows <clears throat> the food to be cooked, the food that's in the water. And, and, they enjoy, and you enjoy both. You enjoy the fire and the water. But fire and water directly... One is going to have to yield. One is going to have to surrender. Either the fire is going to be dominated by the water and that's the end of the fire, or the water is going to be absorbed in the fire and the fire will dry it up and there's no water anymore. But they can't both be in full intensity and be together. Unless there's a mechitza, unless there's a pot. That's how you have peace. That's why we have a mechitza in shul also. (laughs) Because the forces are very, very intense. So when you want peace, you sometimes have to have the right boundaries between the two. Because when you don't have the right boundaries, so ultimately we eat each other up, we consume each other, or we evaporate each other. Or you evaporate me, I evaporate me, you extinguish me, I obliterate you. You have to have boundaries in order to maintain the integrity of each person. This is very important. That's why there's boundaries even in a marriage. That's why there's boundaries in relationships. So now Yosef and Yehuda are really conflicted here about their path in Avodah Hashem, and each one is a king in his own way. Yehuda is the king, but Yosef is the one who's dreaming about all the tribes bowing down to him. Says this Vasem, but what's the truth? But really, Klal Yisrael needs all of these faculties, all of these modalities of expression, all of these energies. Klal Yisrael, the Jewish collective, needs to have fire, and needs to have water. And perfection comes from the convergence, from the synthesis, from the combination of all the various types of midas, various types of emotions. Isn't that how Hashem created a human being? I'm not made of one fabric. A person is comprised the human brain is comprised of midais, mishunais, zumizu. Very interesting expression. Of radically diverse modalities, experiences, emotions, motivations, instincts, proclivities. Bevadai kulam shavim It's a very interesting expression. It says about Sarah that all of her years were equal in goodness. So here he's using this expression of Chazal, Kula. When you look at all of your midas, Kulam Shavim Latoiva, every one of them is good. Every one of them plays an important role in life. And it's so important for a person to be able to accept themselves, to be able to accept themselves and all of their paradoxes. In fact, one of, I would say, one of the most difficult things for many of us is that when we experience certain emotions, we don't know where to put them. We don't know where to put it. And we right away come with judgment. We right away start judging ourselves. I'm a sick person. I'm a paralyzed person. I'm a crazy person. I'm a loser, should be loser. I'm a traumatized person. I'm a wounded person. Look at these horrible emotions that I'm having. We don't know where to put them. We don't know how to say kulam shavim lataiva. Every emotion that's being triggered by you, every single emotion, is, is, it's a voice. It's a voice from your soul. It's telling you something very true. Now the question is how I harness it, what I do with it, right? Where I put it, how I understand it, but the emotion itself, kulam shavim lataiva. Yes, because you're sensitive. If you wouldn't have been sensitive, this and this person or this and this conversation, would have not triggered you. So it's triggering me. Right? This person said something and it's triggering me. Or, the, or I see this person and I'm triggered. Or I read this about this person and I'm triggered. So right away you could start judging yourself and wishing that this part of you would be amputated. But that's not the case. A healthy person is an integrated person. And an integrated person means I have to be able to make space for every emotion that comes up in my life. And we all know 
that one of the hallmarks of psychological health is a sense of personal integration. What is the sense? While I'm composed of many different and contrasting, conflicting attributes and attitudes, can they all work in harmony, forming the person that is me, the person that is you? But it's not so easy. Because for this, I have to accept and make space for my diverse intellectual, physical, and emotional parts for various, various emotions and experiences, and then allow for the harmony. It's not so simple. We're often involved in self-loathing, self-judgment, and rejection. And I would say that very often what we see is we're an integrated personality as a result of certain experiences becomes shattered. Or in some cases, early childhood experiences never allowed an integrated personality to form in the first place. So now we're learning something fundamental. The goal of personal integration is the ability to celebrate all of your diverse intellectual, physical, and emotional components so they can work together to form that whole that is you. And that is a constant effort in the sense that I have to be aware of the fact that kulam shavim letoiva every mida has something very special, very good that is unique to you because it's who you are, it's what your light is, it's the way Hashem's infinity is manifested in the world and if you would be missing one of these midas, it would be something essential to the puzzle of your life and to the puzzle of the universe, it's like amputating a limb of a body chas v'shalom or, 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 or the jigsaw puzzle, right? Getting rid of one part of the puzzle because you don't like how it fits in. You have to see how it fits in. I got it. Now you're thinking, what if I'm having this terrible, terrible emotion? You know, I'm, having, I'm experiencing this hate or this animosity or this jealousy. Is everybody with me here? This is an important conversation. <laughs> if I may say so. It's a very important stuff in life. I'm experiencing this anger. I'm angry at you. I hate you. I want to destroy you. I, I'm thinking, I wish you were gone. Get out of my life. You're triggering me so badly. Where's the kulam shavam latayva here? It's just making me miserable and making the people around me miserable. Right? Good question. Good question. That's why it's so easy to create conflict in ourselves. We get it. Yosef and Yehuda, two great people had this conflict because Yosef embodied a certain Midah and Yehuda threatened it. And Yehuda embodied a certain Midah, Mayim, and Yosef threatened it. Fire and water threaten each other. But the answer is you don't obliterate fire, you don't obliterate water. You have to understand where fire belongs and where water belongs. You have to contextualize them. Of course, in some situations, fire can be the most destructive thing in the world. And in some situations, water can be the most destructive thing in the world. For a person sitting at a beautiful beach and enjoying the water, there's nothing as delightful as water. For a person being swept away in an undercurrent, there's nothing as destroying. The same is true with fire, sitting around the bonfire and enjoying a beautiful glow, watching your Hanukkah candles, Leroy Simbolvad, right? What's, what's more beautiful? What's more beautiful? On the other hand, we know the raging destructions, the, the, the destructive power of fire. So it's all about where, when, what. Every emotion inside of you is part of the story of your life. Every emotion inside of you is part of the story of your life. It's here to teach you something. It's here to make you aware even what you're experiencing as a very negative emotion, if you go back, if you trace it back to the source, you'll see it's telling you a story about yourself. In fact, you may have certain sensitivities that therefore make you uniquely susceptible and uniquely sensitive in this particular area. But the solution is not to get angry at yourself. Because that's actually the problem. The problem is that you're you're not embracing all parts of yourself. The solution is to really put everything in context. 
and to embrace it fully by saying, Kulam Shavam Lataiva. This is Hashem's creation. Hashem did never created a person that has one midah, that has one dimension. The Rambam writes that the difference between an animal and a person, his words are, an animal has poyal echot or shnei piyalim, one modality or two modalities, and a person is, is comprised of every type of modality. <laughs> there's chesed and gvur and teferis and netzach and hoid, yisoid and malchus and chachma and bin and das, and there's chesed, shabbat chesed and gvur, shabbat chesed and teferis, shabbat chesed and gvur, shabbat gvur and teferis, shabbat gvur, you know, 49 streaks, it's very, very detailed with spheres haimah. So he says, Klal Yisrael can't afford to have one or the other. You need all the koiches, and perfection doesn't come from amputation. It comes from all the midas, because Hashem created an Adam, a person, to have midas, meshunai, zumi, zu, completely diverse midas, but kulam shavam lataiva. And personal integration is when you can create space for literally every mida, every primal, primal, uh, uh, what are they? We all have midas really represent our primal innate drives, yearnings, loves. You can't get rid of them. You don't want to get rid of them. This is your creation. This is who you are. Every, every, sens- every emotion you're experiencing, every sensation in your body you're experiencing, every sensation in your body you're experiencing is just a manifestation of a primal, inner, innate drive. None of them are bad. None of them are evil. None of them are heinous. They can sometimes be misunderstood, misconstrued, and lead me to do something that may be foolish, immoral, unethical. Absolutely. That's where we have a Shulchan Aruch. (laughs) We have a code of law. Certain things are good, Certain things are not good. Certain things are moral. Certain things are immoral. But your midas are not moral and immoral. You have to be able to create space for each and every midah because it's part of your story. It's part of your personality. This is the ultimate call for inner acceptance on a very deep emotional level that allows for integration. And then you'll be able to see that they're not really threatening each other. Kulam shavam l'toiva means that ultimately, deep down, they're all trying to help you reach a good place. But some of them are making me aware of certain pains that I have, of certain fears that I have, of certain sensitivities that I have, and certain things I have to work through. Now, this is really, this is a very, this is a deep idea. This is not a simple idea. Because it's really, I wanted to say it's a lifetime of work, but it's maybe a few lifetimes of work, but really it's also a moment of work. It's not just a lifetime of work. Don't look at this and say, oh, you know, maybe when I'm 105 years old, I'll figure it out. No, no, it happens right now. It happens right now in having compassion and creating space for everything that's going on in me. And that's the whole idea of what we always talk about, Gullus versus Gula. Right? In Gullus, we subjugate part of ourselves. And in Gula, we sublimate everything by turning the Aleph into Goyla. The Aleph is Yaakov Avinu, right? Av starts with an Aleph, the one, Echad. That's the Etzem HaTorah that infuses all the 13 pathways of Torah. And when you have the oneness there, there is space for every Midah. And now he gives an example. Utsrichim l'isnaig b'simcha u'bahachna u'bishaskos. L'isnaig pa'am b'zeh, pa'am b'zeh atshabayin l'shleim b'samiti. He says, which, which pathway is the right pathway in life? A person ought to live with joy. A person ought to live with the ability to surrender. Hachna means surrender, subservience. A person ought to live with his chaskos, with tremendous strength. Chazak, chazak, venis chazak, as we're going to say to the Shabbos. Which one is right? He says, sometimes the behavior warrants this quality. Sometimes my behavior warrants another quality. Sometimes my behavior doesn't warrant ultimate self-actualization and dignity. What I need is, I need to listen. I need to be vulnerable. I need to cry. I need to pour out my heart like water. That's where you are. And sometimes, sometimes what we want is absolute inner dignity and joy and healthy pride (laughs) and strength and power and potency. Don't amputate one or the other. They're all part of your unique mosaic. 
And that's the real Shlemus. The real Shlemus. The real Shlemus is the entire jigsaw puzzle. It's the entire orchestra. It's the entire symphony. We don't get rid of some of the instruments. We don't tell the drummer, you're disturbing the violinist. We're throwing you out of the symphony. The drummer has his unique role to play. And the celloist has his unique music to play. And every song is made up of different notes. And every body is made up of 70 or 60 trillion cells. (laughs) What do you need 60 trillion cells for? (laughs) And they all get along. In a healthy organ, they all get, isn't it amazing? 60 trillion, right? Sometimes you have a shul, 20 people can't get along. But in your body, 60 trillion, imagine putting 60 trillion Jews together to run a country, right? Look what's at, what happens in Israel. But somehow God figured out how to do it. 60 trillion cells are getting along, and I don't even know about it. <laughs> so what's the idea? The idea is that peace, real peace, never ever contradicts diversity. It's true of Klal Yisrael and it's true of every individual. Listen to this. We all have a machloikas in our heart. We're all fighting with it. With, we're not, some of us are fighting with each other. I don't mean at this class. But we're, sometimes we have fights. But the biggest fight is inside here. Machloikas believe by the fight inside of me. We often sense that people who are at war with others are not just at war with others, right? First and foremost, they're at war with themselves. Because when you're really at peace with yourself, you're at peace with others. Every war that you'll see between one person and another person is a war within myself first. There's something in me that's unresolved. What a beautiful insight. So the macro represents the micro. The micro reflects the macro, and the macro reflects the micro. Micro, for those who don't know, is my individual, my my own existence, and macro is the larger existence. They reflect each other. So he says as follows. If the machloikis in your own heart is l'shem shamayim, meaning the midais, your midais, your own emotional drives, your own primal yearnings, are conflicting with each other. L'shem shemaim for the sake of heaven. Each one is really trying to capture the truth of God, which means your own truth. Don't worry about it. You know how repair is going to happen? All of them coming together. Soifun l'eskaim. Every part of you can be accepted. But for this, you need a machlekes l'shem shemaim. And that makes all the difference. In other words, your genuine conflicts that exist in you because you're trying to access truth, none of those have to be neutralized or eliminated or amputated or obliterated. They have to be integrated. And they will be integrated, not by getting rid of any of them, but by contextualizing it and knowing, vu, vas, ven, making space for it. And when you make space for it, you're going to grow from it. Because if you wouldn't make space for it, what do we do often? What do we often do? There's something inside of me that is driving me crazy. What do I do? I suppress it. I repress it. That's what Yehuda did to Yosef. He threw Yosef into the pit. What a graphic image for repression. Reb Moshe, are you with me? Throwing your brother into the pit just means taking a part of yourself and burying it. I love that. You don't have to. Don't be threatened by Yosef. He's not going to kill you. I know he's fire. Don't worry. You need fire. Yosef, don't be threatened by Yehuda. He's water. You need water. (laughs) You need water. Don't be afraid of it. So we take Yosef, we throw him into a pit. And we say, you don't rear your head anymore in my life. You stay buried in this pit. And then we sell him into slavery. We're going to do anything to get rid of Yosef. But he's going to come back. Because he lives inside of us. You can't bury Yosef. You can't bury Yosef. You need to learn about Yosef. You need to integrate him. So if the machlaikas is not L'shem Shamayim, if it's conflict for the sake of conflict, then what happens? He says, ain't so for In other words, sometimes my midas are being expressed 
in destructive, ungodly ways, there you have to say, this is not part of my life anymore. You have to know how to cut things out of your life. Certain patterns, certain behaviors, certain words, certain thoughts. A person has to say, I'm going away from this lifestyle. But the midos that are Hashem Shamayim, the conflicts inside of me, that are all really a reflection of a truth, nah, this is going to make you grow. This is going to make you aware. And therefore, all the midos are going to come together, the siphon this guy. And he continues. Somebody asks, I find that a conflict, an internal conflict, is always necessary for a better understanding of ourselves. Yes, Ms. Balak, that's exactly the point. When I'm experiencing an inter- eternal co- e- internal conflict, it's simply an alarm clock to make me curious and aware of who I am and where I need to work on myself. And that's amazing. Equanimity is the hopeful result of integration. This was Sarah, as I understand. Kulam shavim l'tayva. So all her years can be merged and be seen as good, even though they were filled with vicissitudes. Yosef and Yehuda were two people, were two separate people. Doesn't that emphasize that the desire to be aligned was just one part of ourselves? How did we jump? from Yosef and Yehuda to Sarah, who embodied it in one person. Right, so the expression kulam shavam l'tayva, he's just using from Sarah. I was just mentioning where he got that expression from. It's true about Sarah, but it was just an expression used from Sarah to apply to a person's internal midas. Sounds reminiscent of the mimer we learned, Parsha Shlach, about the color of our soul and our primal drives. Yes, I was just thinking about that. In last spring, we learned a mimer of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Shlach Tovshin Tesvav, 1955. I think we had seven or eight class, six or seven or eight classes on it, about not changing your midas, about respecting and understanding your primal drives and where the role of the mind is when it comes to those primal drives. And the argument between the spies and Kalev and Yeshua, the spies said that you can't conquer Eretz Yisrael, it's unconquerable, your primal drives are untouchable. A very, very fascinating discussion. This is very, very much connected to that because a major discussion over there was never the need to obliterate, but the need for ultimate real acceptance. And when there's real acceptance from a place of L'Shem Shamayim, we grow spiritually and emotionally and psychologically from it. Question. All very nice, but how do I calm myself down at the heat of emotions? And I think it's for the better. And there's a challenging conflict. And I'm so passionate Yes, after my emotions cool down, that's fine. But immediately, I'm so upset and I'm so angry. And I'm going with my instinct and I'm going with my flow. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> great question, great question. So, so here's the rule. You know, when you're in the middle of a very heated emotion, you have to be aware of that and respect that. You know, if I'm, if I'm just overwhelmed and, and startled, I have to be aware of that. And I have to be aware of the fact that now is not the time for analysis. In fact, analysis is not going to do me well. Now is the time for being aware of what I'm experiencing, having even compassion for what I'm experiencing, and then making the right choices. And the right choices are based on what do you really think is the good thing to do? What does God want you to do? What does Torah say you should do? What does your real neshama want you to do? And what are you going to be proud of in five days? (laughs) Which decision are you going to be proud of? You know, I know people who in the midst of their anger got divorced, sold their home, sold their business, ran away. And then they were not proud of those decisions. So in the midst of a very difficult moment, you don't have to figure everything out. You could just be aware of what you're experiencing. You could tell yourself, I'm fuming. I'm fuming. You know, maybe, maybe you need to go out. Maybe you need to take a walk. You need some oxygen. You know, drink some lemon water. Take a cold shower. Whatever it is, do 50 push-ups. 
come to us, watch one of our shiurim, whatever it is, calm down. But before you calm down, just be aware that right now I'm in a very, very difficult place. Have compassion for it and then make decisions. Thank God, my child love you could make decisions. The more awareness you have, the more decisions you can make, the more choices you have, and you can make decisions that you're going to be proud of in five years from now. And you'll be able to say, I had a very difficult moment, but I made the right decision. And therefore, we have to be aware of what we say and what we do. This is what a responsible person is. Right? But then afterwards, you can go back and ask yourself what happened and learn from it and grow from it. Big question that always comes up with this mindset is moral relativism. So I happen to disagree with this. I mean, I don't disagree with the question. It's a good question. But this is not moral relativism. It's not. The Svas Emes is not saying here, and certainly it's not how he lived, is not, is not advocating here moral relativism. He's not saying that when I have an emotion to break your window or to punch somebody in the nose or to insult somebody in public, I should follow through. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that there are no values that are productive and moral and actions that are ethical and actions that are unethical. He's not saying that the entire reality of morality is relative to a person's instincts at any given moment. What he is saying is, what he is saying is, that every single emotion that comes up in my life has a space within the divine, infinite reality. And if it's L'Shem Shemaim, if I'm looking for L'Shem Shemaim, if the machlaikas, if the conflicts in me are genuine expressions of what I'm going through, each one will ultimately prove to be a factor in my healing and in my wholeness. There was a Rebbe who had a cast coat. He kept it in the closet. When he felt himself getting angry, he would go to the closet, take off his coat he was wearing, take out the other coat and put it on. Before he even got the coat on, his anger would subside and he would be able to express himself in speech or action or silence in a more effective way. So let me understand. Are you saying, accept the threads Don't throw them into a pit. Or what you're saying is that when we zealots that are L'Shem Shemayim look at it with empathy and trying to understand where their heat comes from. I understand. This is hard. Both are true. But here he's actually focusing on ourselves. The ability to be able to integrate within myself all the Midas and understand that Yehuda and Yosef ultimately had to learn not to be threatened by each other. Don't be threatened by your various emotions. They look like they want to kill each other. They don't. It looks like they want to kill each other. Yehuda thought Yosef wants to destroy them. Yosef thought Yehuda wants to destroy him. That's why he did this whole trial and testing in Egypt to see if Yehuda would sacrifice himself for Binyamin. Ultimately, they learned we don't have to threat. We're not threatened by each other. And when we're not threatened by each other, you know what happens? We help each other. We create a larger personality. That's what happens in our own personality, and it's what happens in Klal Yisrael. Again, the macro macro and the micro work together. We see this in the angels. It says, We say it every day, right? What does it mean? Hashem makes peace in His heights. Say Chazal, Michal Sar Shalmayim, Gavriel Shalesh, Hakadosh Baruch Hu Oyser Shalom, Kemaykin Hoyu Ashvatam Lamata. The angel of Michael Michal represents the spiritual energy of water. Gabriel, the angel of Gavriel, represents fire. Oyser Shalom Bimraimov, Hashem fosters peace in his own heights. Why? Because a real angel represents. The fat, real angel is, understands that he's a shliach. The word malach in Hebrew means by Yishlach Yaakov, malachim, malachim are shluchim, messengers. A malach is a shliach. When you understand that you are a messenger of God, so now Hashem needs fire and Hashem needs water. That's what the Shavatim ultimately became. 
That's what they became a manifestation of. And this is so important because let's, 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 let's understand what we're saying. What's our pledge of allegiance? What's the motto of the Jewish people? Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, God is our God, God is one. Right? We say it twice a day, many of us say it three times a day, some people say it even more. This is our national anthem. Some of you said it already this morning, some of you will say it after the shir. Make sure you don't miss the time. What does it really mean in our everyday lives? We all say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. What, did, what are you thinking today? What did you think today when you said Shema Yisrael? So here is, here, is what I want you, here is what I want you to go away with. The creation of the universe basically resulted in the singularity of Hashem being expressed in an apparent multiplicity. Out of the one came day and night, fire and water, heaven and earth, stars and galaxies, oceans and deserts, volcanoes and icebergs, male and female, cultures, nations, different peoples, Jews, non-Jews, and within each person himself or herself, 70 trillion cells, hundreds of thousands of millions different species of life. We don't have one type of bird. We have 9,000 type of birds. We don't have one type of insects. We have millions of types of insects. We don't have one type of mammal. We have six or 7,000 types of mammals. We don't have 10 million types of fish. We don't have one type of fish. We have millions of types of fish. At least what we know is 2 million, I think. I don't know, we have to check it out. And I think they still haven't discovered many types of fish. But it's all one God. So from one came apparent multiplicity, contradiction, paradox, day and night, fire and water, heaven and earth. But all of it, all of this amazing diversity in the world outside and in the world inside came from one. Look at the diversity in DNA molecules in your genome. Every living organism, from a plant to a banana, to a hyena, to a chimpanzee, to a person, we're all created, we all use the same dictionary, DNA, but with tiny little sequences that change it. So from all, all this amazing diversity came from one. Because every one is a different and necessary expression of what is contained within the one. This is the key. Every aspect of diversity is a necessary expression that captures something that is contained inside the one. If there is no such incredible diversity, if everything and everyone instead already came to us as similar and uniform, then saying Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad would be meaningless. It would be unremarkable. It's only meaningful because of the diversity. So when you say God is one, you know what you're really saying? You're one. Your family is one. You and your spouse are one. You and your children are one. The world is one. That's not so simple. <laughs> that needs a meditation. But that's what you're saying. Everyone is an expression a necessary and a different expression of that which is contained within the one. I capture one aspect, you capture another aspect. And every part of me captures another aspect of Echad. Yosef and Yehuda had different personalities and different approaches. But when they stopped viewing their differences as a threat, that's the key. When your wife stops threatening you and your husband stops threatening you, and your colleague, your partner, your friend, your roommate, your neighbor, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your sister-in-law, your nephew, your niece, your uncle, or a stranger, when they're not a threat to me because Hashem Echad, so now what happens? Then I can appreciate the diversity like a naturalist who appreciates the diversity of nature, a beautiful expression of the grandeur of the Creator, and I can then appreciate the beauty of the whole. So because Yosef and his brothers had a conflict with Shem Shamayim, ultimately they were no longer threatened by their differences. They can appreciate that their varied, disparate approaches and attitudes reflected the harmony of God himself. When you can appreciate that within yourself, and it's not easy within yourself. We like judging ourselves. We're Jews, especially the Ashkenazim. 
the cerebral Ashkenazim. As somebody once said, Jews feel guilty. And if a Jew doesn't feel guilty, he blames himself. We love judging ourselves for the sake of heaven. But most of that judgment is counterproductive. When we appreciate the beauty that results from the integration of that diversity, it's literally like the very different sounding instruments in an orchestra playing together, but very different instruments. This can heal any society, as it did for Yosef and his brothers, and it can heal any soul in its own journey. I found that Medrash Tanchum in Vayigash, Yosef Shorvi Yehuda Ari. Yosef is the ox, Yehuda is a lion. Vuhu Kanal is the same idea. Arye li yemina v'shar l'smoy l'bchinus ha'gvur sh'nikreish. In the vision of Yecheskel, the lion is on the right, the ox is on the left. This represents water, and it represents fire. Gvur is fire. So this coincides with this idea. And when the two come together, and they're not threatened with each other, then each and every single one of them contributes something special to the entire whole. This is very deep. I guess all of my judgment is my inner critic of myself. I'm so judgmental of being judgmental. (laughs) I'm so judgmental about being judgmental. I like that. It's a loop. It's a loop. Yes, but you know what? We have to accept that also. We have to accept that that judgmentalism is coming from, from, from something unresolved, from something I need to embrace in myself. Because when I'm in a real space, when I'm in the space of an affinity, I don't go to judgment. So there's something I need to really, really learn about myself, and it's an opportunity for growth. It's probably rare that a fight would actually be L'Shem Shamayim, because by definition, someone who's really integrated wouldn't feel threatened by contradictions or differences. It's very true, especially today, it's very hard to look at a fight and say, oh, this is really, really L'Shem Shemayim. The point is, sometimes there are serious arguments, and that's not a bad thing. Sometimes the arguments can end up in very serious arguments. We have seen it in different stories, even with very great people. But the real point is, I have to always go back to my vulnerability and really try to see what is happening inside of my own soul. And that makes... That makes that makes all the difference, all the difference. Okay, my dearest friends, I see more questions. Wow, interesting questions, Chavre. Beautiful. Thank you for the feedback. I think that, uh, you know, I think this is such a, uh, such an important idea of people are afraid that when you say this, you're going to give people a license to start smashing windows, burning houses, beating up people, stealing money because just accept yourself. But I think it's the other way around. <laughs> I really think it's the other way around. When you can create space for all of your emotions, then they don't have to overtake you and express themselves in undesirable ways. Because when they're repressed, when they're buried, (laughs) they have to surface in very aggressive and brazen and abrasive ways. When you really create space for everything in your body, if you remember what we learned, Parshas Chai Sara, how everything Sara tells you, you have to listen to her. The Zoyer says that Sara is the body and Avram is the soul. You have to listen to the voice of your body. So you create space for those sensations. You create space for the voice of the body. You don't have to bury it. You don't have to crush it. You don't have to destroy it. You can respect it and make space for it and realize that kulam shavam lataiva. So now what happens is these emotions actually can find rest. They can find a little serenity. And you know what happens? My, my, my true convictions and my true core, which is always divine, can emerge. And instead of these emotions needing to attack and show that they exist, they actually have a space. And I can actually live up to my truest and deepest primal motives, which are always a reflection of the divine. 
two breaths. Taking a breath, yes, not reacting immediately with words. Because you regret it. We often regret it. The Baal Shem Tev said when you're angry, you should be silent for 61 minutes. Wow. You go out. The Baal Shem Tev said when somebody is angry, they should be silent for 61 minutes. Don't react, you know. Your child says something, you get very angry. You're going to say something you're going to regret. Don't do it. Where is, where is he writing? Where is the writing? I have to look in Keser Shem Tev, it's Avasa Rivash. 61 minutes. Yeah. 61 minutes. At least. Some people, I would say, they should be quiet for a couple of years. But the. Huh? Well, 60 is an hour, and you always add another minute. <laughs> you add another minute, you know, just to make sure. Sveke de Raisa Lechomra. Just like beer chametz, we do an hour early, right? <laughs> So you wait an hour, you wait an hour <laughs> before your chametz takes over, and you uh, you wait another minute. You wait another minute. Not Parshat. Try it out. Your kids saw something, you want to blow up right at the Shabbos table. Be aware, have compassion. You may have to go out for a few minutes, that's fine. Talk to the trees. Talk to the trees. Talk to Hashem. Shifchi chamayim libech. Pour out your heart like water. Say, God, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I need your help. I need your help. That's fine. And you may have to work out stuff. Later, you'll figure out a lot of stuff. You're going to learn from it. But now you have to know you have a 10-year-old boy, a 10-year-old girl. Think what you're going to say. Sometimes, obviously, we lose ourselves. Spontaneously, we lose ourselves. We lose it. Okay, take accountability. And I could say, I'm sorry. I can apologize. But in speech, Always. And Always. There's a, you need a space. Right? There's the the hay. It says in Swarm, hay is machshava dibur maisa. The roof on top is thought. The wall on the right is words. And the little leg on the left is action. And there's a little space. A little space between thoughts, words, and actions. Because thoughts go into words, but before you go into action, pause. I wish you all in the meantime a wonderful day. It's a pleasure to have all of you here. Thank you, everybody, for your unique contribution. Unique contribution to this class. Have a beautiful and inspiring and integrated day. Okay, Chavra. Sending love and blessings. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.